So my name is Sam and I am speaking to you, which I love doing virtually this part, but I'm speaking to you from the unceded homelands of the Ojibwa, Ottawa and Potawatomi known today as Detroit, Michigan. And I recognize that these people still fight to live throughout Michigan, including on the nearby reservation of Wapo Island. Today I'm gonna to discuss, as my title suggests, the persistence of classism in contemporary art. I intend to highlight the extremes of valuation and artistic endeavors through exemplifying several instances where contemporary art and punk rock not only share the same concepts, but were in the same spaces and frequently created by the same people. My favorite place to start any discussion is defining terms. And I understand we may be familiar with the terms that I'm using. I think defining them um, helps us all be on the same definition and the same page. So to start with contemporary art and starting with the dictionary.com definition, since that's the one most would access that don't already have some degree of understanding of it. Contemporary is existing, occurring, or living at the same time, belonging to the same time. And art is the quality, production, expression, or realm according to aesthetic principles of what is beautiful, appealing, or more than ordinary significance. And to bring it into a more specific definition, oh, excuse me, wrangling my cat. Um, the Walker Art Center, which was my favorite definition, states that contemporary art is made today by living artists. As such, it reflects the complex issues that shape our diverse global and rapidly changing world. Through their work, many contemporary artists explore personal or cultural identity, other critiques of social and institutional structures, or even attempt to redefine art itself in the process, they often raise difficult or thought-provoking questions without providing answers. Curiosity, an open mind, and a commitment to dialogue and debate are the best tools in which to approach a work of contemporary art. For punk rock, I'll be starting with the dictionary.com definition, which is really the only, um, I guess, globally used or at least nationally used definition. And so it states that punk rock is a type of rock and roll reaching its peak in the late 1970s and characterized as loud, insistent music and abusive or violent protest lyrics and whose performers and followers are distinguished by extremes of dress and socially defiant behavior. An institutional definition for punk rock is a harder one to come by because magazines, critics, and producers define the genre th through their own personal biases and capitalistic needs. Thereby, they shift the definition to address various waves of punk. But asking punks and non-punks currently operating today, certain identifiers came up such as DIY, a particular undefined sound, anti-authoritarian, Antifa, or anarchists, alternative to the norm, blue collar, community-based, forum for truth, and though shifting, certain visual identifiers are often mentioned as they relate to style and dress. There we go. And so I'll be starting my timeline with punk rock's beginning. The origin is often argued and confused, but I feel confident in the assertion that punk rock started in the 60s with the Velvet Underground in New York, which was only 82 years ago, and that places that in a contemporary timeline. And my question, the title of which brow, I'm referencing to highbrow, being something of superior intellect, interest, or taste, and lowbrow, something that is uninterested, uninvolved, or uneducated in intellectual activities or pursuits, and the attributions of these distinctions that don't actually match the maker's interest. In my experience, punk rock is viewed as lowbrow, despite conceptual and physical overlaps with fine art, which is considered highbrow. Starting with the aforementioned Velvet Underground, pictured here on the left, and their more, more well-known overlap, Andy Warhol, on the right, pictured with um, Lou Reed. Uh, Warhol is listed as one of the producers of their self-titled album, The Velvet Underground and Nico, and his artwork and name are on the jacket art. 
Lou Reed is also one of the stars of Warhol's screen tests, which are short films acting as revealing portraits of hundreds of different individuals that were filmed between 1963 and 1966. A lesser known overlap is bassist Larry Estridge. And in, in addition to being the one of the founding members of the band, he's also an alumni of ha Harvard and was an accomplished sculptor. Sculptor. What makes, and so I ponder what makes an original Warhol print sell for millions of dollars and the original Velvet Underground and Nico pressing only hundreds. Both were mass produced and not necessarily by the artist himself. So why has society deemed the paper higher than the sound? In reading from Mud Club to Montmartre by Bernard Gendron, he mentions the relationship between the two and also reminded me of a weird position that the Velvet Underground is frequently put in. Oftentimes the band isn't viewed as punk. Gendron positions them as pre-punk based on the writings in Cream Magazine and Rolling Stone. Throughout his book, the various bands discussed are seemingly excluded from the distinction of punk if they are found to be financially successful or intellectuals. These divisive categorization, uh, categorizations seem to attempt to stay within the limiting definitions or stereotypes as presented in the ab above. The only motivation for Gendron removing their punk title, as he did with several other musicians, was because of either some degree of financial success, acceptance by intellectuals, or being intellectuals themselves. A life of accrued wealth is an odd valuation. The Velvet Underground's lead, Lou Reed, had an estate of only 10 million at his death of 71 years old, while Warhol was worth 220 million when he died at 58. Another punk crossover mentioned in From Mud Club to Montmartre, and because of their intellectual standing, Gendron denies them their punk card is the Talking Heads. They, like so many other punk, punk bands, pay played their first show at CBGB's in New York, which is the quintessential punk club of the 60s and 70s, and arguably until its doors closed in 2006. Talking Heads frequently toured with the Ramones as well. When Talking Heads formed in 1975, three out of four members were students at the Rhode Island School of Design and the fourth student, or the fourth member was a student at Harvard. This pedigree is what Gendron uses to deny punk affiliation along with their preference to museums over reckless partying. The titles Brands or genres placed on bands seem to be more about marketing and sales than they do with the bands themselves. The stereotype of the Neanderthalic and destructive punk musician seems to me to be a weapon used to discredit the validity of punk, as well as sell the movement to a specifically targeted audience. If the entire marketing ploy of labels representing punk bands is the danger factor, one frequently used in rock music, how can they explain the intellectuals within their ranks? Instead of allowing for a broader view of punk, new wave or post-punk were labels bestowed on those bands, like Talking Heads, that didn't fitly, ne neatly fit into the punk brand as created by record label companies and hit rock music, uh, magazines. Seymour Stein of Sire Records, who first signed Talking Heads, credits their first album's commercial flop with their attachment to punk. And so he rebranded the band as the new wave. Nothing about the band was different. They still played the same and thought the same, but because of the removal of their punkness, they were viewed as safe, marketable, profitable, and were allowed airtime on radio stations as their records rapidly sold out. Similar to Talking Heads, Destroy All Monsters formed at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, while in art school in 1972. Destroy All Monsters' original lineup came together to create music in the French futurist style as an extension of their visual art creation. They used all instruments and noisemakers to create their intuitive sounds, and no two performances were ever the same. As a group, 
They also created non-musical performances and visual arts, taking inspiration from the Dada movement of Weimar. Inspiration came not just from fine art movements, but also musical groups like Sun Ra, John Cage, Frank Zappa, Velvet Underground, The Stooges, and more, as listed by Nicole Rudick in Return of the Repressed, Destroy All Monsters, 1973 to 1977. Their shows were more of ha happenings with only a few being officially booked and planned gigs. Like a lot of punk bands, they were misunderstood, booed, and had things thrown at them until they left the stage. Similarly to their performances, their visual arts didn't receive a warm reception at that time either. When whether included at the U of M student shows, the Detroit Artists Market, or when Shaw set up at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, even his $10 collages wouldn't move. Carrie Lauren showed at the Ann Arbor Film Festival in the 70s, but was more interested in producing a magazine that could spread it through the public more freely. Unlike the Talking Heads, however, Destroy All Monsters didn't become famous for their music. Instead, band members Mike Kelly and Jim Shaw earned notoriety for their visual arts only after moving to California to finish their art training. And in my research, this is one of the things that bothered me most. I grew up in Michigan. I studied art and art history in Detroit from my, and from my alma mater and my home. I can walk to Mike Kelly's mobile homestead or Jim Shaw's beloved Hamtramck, but I didn't learn about Destroy All Monsters until I started to dig into the history of punk rock in Detroit and found the Detroit Punk Archive. Why in a state that is fiercely proud of its progeny is this punk and art connection completely left out? And Michigan is full of a lot of punk and art crossovers, and the more I dig, the more I find. And one of my favorites is Jerry Vile. His name may ring a bell to some of you because he earned his 15 minutes of fame during the Detroit bankruptcy talks. He was loudly critical of the city's attempts to sell off the city and took out ads for flash sales on monuments, placed an enormous Crisco can at the Joe Louis Fist and littered the lawn of the Detroit Institute of Arts with hundreds of plastic lawn vultures. In his 20s, he published a zine called Orbit that discussed pop popular culture of its time, and its logo can be seen on a Quentin Tarantino t-shirt in the film Pulp Fiction. In the 1980s, Vile was the lead singer for Detroit punk band The Boners. When Jerry Vile, with Jerry Vile heading up The Boners, he led them more into a performance art group. He themed the sets and with costumes and rigging and sometimes created complicated pulley systems to hoist him through the air as he sang. Now, every February, you can come to Detroit to find Vile hosting The Dirty Show at the Russell Industrial Center, which is an art show themed on kink, sex, and taboo pleasures that shows the traditional arts alongside stage acts. And that brings my timeline into the present day, like today. And it's now that there's a small appreciation for punk rock within the art world, but only selected punks and only selected spaces and only written about by select critics. While visiting LA in uh, 2019, I visited the Museum of Contemporary Art. And after passing through one of several doorways, I turned around to find a full wool paste up of Raymond Pettibon, specifically his Xeroxed concert flyers for Bad uh, Black Flag, uh, a band he was a founding member of. Similar to how the art discourse prioritizes Mike Kelly's visual arts with rare to no mention of Destroy All Monsters. It seems Raymond Pettibon's long art career is just a regional footnote as well. Kim Gordon postulates that, quote, wandering outside the realm of the art world and attached to the music subculture, Pettibon can depict a wider range of subject matter than is considered appropriate or even possible within the avant-garde of the art world because of the inhibiting values that prevail in that system, end quote. She, continu uh, she continues to compare Pettibon and Warhol to exemplify this. 
Warhol operating in a more sterilized and capitalistic pop art is centered in his production, evident by what he's uh, most memorized for today, where Pettibon had the freedom to use infamous real life villains to hold up a mirror to society. Punk has always been welcoming and open to a wide range of social and political criticisms, a diverse style of creation, and all levels of creatives. There's a sophisticated shock culture that exists within the punk aesthetic, and they don't shy away from taboo topics or imagery like the art world still will. Kim Gordon herself is no stranger to the punk art crossover. She has an art degree from Otis in California and was a member of Sonic Youth. After college, she moved to New York, where she wrote for Art Forum, which is what I quoted while talking about Pettibon. She also curated a show at White Columns Gallery, which included Mike Kelly, a previously mentioned punk art crossover. And while with Sonic Youth, she had a strong supporting role in visual and non-musical performance artists as a director, producer, curator, and friend. And I do want to take a moment again to re-clarify the fluidity of punk, because there's a lot of weird distinctions between punk, no wave, and new wave, and all of the subgenres that have some of the slimmest differences, as Stein himself made clear, using it as a marketing tool. Kim Gordon herself even talked about this punk new wave thing in stating, quote, when I came to New York, I'd go to see bands downtown playing no wave music, she recalled of her arrival after graduating from art school. It was expressionistic and it was also nihilistic. Punk rock was tongue in cheek saying, yeah, we're destroying rock. But to her, no wave music was more like, no, we're really destroying rock. It was very dissonant. It felt like wow, this is really free. I could do that, end quote. But I can't help but wonder if at that time, at least, she wasn't being misled to view the distinction between the genres because of their marketing. Kim Gordon has since returned back to visual arts with the dissolve of her band and marriage. And as explained in her memoir, Girl in a Band, she had a lot of support from sculptor Dan Graham. Which I apologize for not advancing my slides. That's Kim Gordon in band and art. And for Dan Graham, he is an enormous fan of rock music, with some of his focus being on punk, hardcore, and noise. In his video work from 1984, Rock My Religion, he brings punk into the gallery and therefore into art discourse. This work is subject of an edition of one work by After All Books, written by British Ghanaian writer, theorist, and filmmaker Kojwo Ishun, and he quotes Harvard professor Benjamin Buklo, who, was, who has written about many modern and contemporary artists, including Dan Graham. These two respected and distinguished members of the art world give some validity to the work, and I believe to what I'm presenting here with this more recent um, Sorry, and this more recent publishing either confirms an importance on the punk art crossover or the art world's insistence on monetizing works of that nature as a rank of importance and therefore continued discourse. Eshin points out what I find to be an important idea within the work as shared by the two main subjects in Rock My Religion. One that points, out, points specifically at capitalism. The phrase used is, quote, the social murder committed by capitalism, end quote, by Eshin at, and that quote used by Eshin adds interesting layers to me, because he uses a term in description of the Shakers protecting themselves, which was a group of celibate communist American women from the 1700s that appear throughout the video. But the term social murder was first used by philosopher Friedrich Engels when discussing the working class of England in the 1800s. And it doesn't seem to be by accident that this turn of phrase is used since the punk and hardcore movements came out of working class and lower city kids that were sick of a life forced on them from their class and the plastic consumer driven society of the 50s. A quote within the original video um, that I'd like to share, and it was text put across the screen is, um, and from the book is at 
uh, time marker 5209, Patty Smith sings Ain't It Strange and begins to, and Ain't It Strange begins to play and text rolls across the screen that reads, in the 1970s, the religion of the 50s teenager and the 60s counterculture is adopted by pop artists who propose the end of religion of art for art's sake. Patti Smith took this one step further. She saw rock as an art form which could come to replace poetry, painting, and sculpture. If art is only a business, as Warhol suggests, then music expresses a more communal, transcendental, emotional art, which now deny, which art now denies. Patti Smith herself is one of our punk godmothers, an artist and poet herself, and was a lover and muse to Maple Thorpe at the start of his career. And to wrap things up, the only reason that I can find the high and low distinction between art and punk is the heavily is the heavy influence of capitalism on the art market. The big hitters that take top billing in the art discourse are those that have an unreachable price tag. And it's hard to sticker a work of art with a high tag that is freely posted up on every street corner or passed out at every show. And to quote Fran Leibowitz, quote, you go to an auction and out comes a Picasso, dead silence. Once the hammer comes down on the price, applause. We live in a world where they applaud the price, but not the Picasso. My assertion of classism within art and punk is the disparity in valuation. Poor punks are kept down and kept poor, while artists willing to shuck their punk titles are paid well and lifted into the upper class. And I feel like acknowledging these crossovers is a start to trying to find the answers as to why they are viewed so differently.